And here we go. We have lift off. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Yikes, you bet, concur. Welcome to another NASA Spaceflight Live. This is a special edition because we have a special guest. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and we are joined today by CEO of Rocket Lab, Mr. Peter Beck. Peter, thank you so much for joining us for a very special episode of NSF Live. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be on the show, Jack. Excellent. And of course, we also have another NSFer on the stream. Sawyer, thank you for joining us for what proves what will prove to be, I'm sure, a really fun interview. Thanks, Jack. I'm really excited. And Peter, again, thank you so much for joining us. We've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Good deal. All right. So as you all know out there in viewer land, uh, if you have any questions for Peter, uh, type at NASA Spaceflight into chat, and we'll see your question pop up in some software that we have running in the background. So with that all out of the way, I think that's all the housekeeping. Let's jump right into it, and let's talk about Electron. Um, Peter, you guys recently had an anomaly on an Electron flight, and you've recently closed out that anomaly investigation. Um, let's just hear a little bit more about you know what happened and how you were able to determine um you know what the issue was maybe mitigations that sort of thing yeah well i mean gee we could use the whole time just talking about that because um you know electron has, has got such a, a you know, long flight heritage now that any anomaly wasn't going to be like super simple where somebody just forgot to screw something on it was going to be really convoluted and difficult which which is exactly what it turned out to be um, so, um, you know, perhaps I should, should kind of start with, um, you know, how we, how we kind of got to, got to, you know, the root cause and, um, you know, so obviously, uh, we, we had a successful, you know, first stage separation and, um, we, we, we got the start of an, of an of ignition kind of transient of the second stage. But, you know, during that kind of, uh, ignition transient, there's, there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff obviously happens um, and uh, kind of if you want to boil it down to its, its most elementary form possible there was essentially an electrical arc occurred um, which pulled down the, the whole voltage you know we have a high voltage system and a low voltage system on, on electron and there was a high voltage arc that pulled down obviously the high voltage rail but also it was an arc to chassis so it pulled down the low, low voltage rail as well so that, that's, that's the, the easiest way to describe it now, electrons are a little bit unique in the fact that we have, you know, uh, electric turbo pumps or electric pumps that pump the propellant, um, you know, into the into the Rutherford engine. So we have that we have that 500 volt um, rail there um, sitting sitting at that, that potential. So um, you know, when when the arc occurred, if you if you go back to the live stream, you can see you can actually visually see a, you know a, a big kind of greeny glow for a you know a, a small amount of time. The whole the whole event you know was about one point six seconds or so, so it's very short you know transient to you know you know to, to try and capture. But the team did an awesome job. Um, we started off um, obviously in you know a failure investigation. You, you create a you know a tree and the object of the exercise to to lob as many branches of the tree off as you can. So there was hundreds of sub investigations you know occurring all concurrently. But we we're able to to actually pinpoint the location of the arc. Through some pretty devious methods, 
So we've got some folks on staff who do do quite a bit with uh, movies and, and things like that. And they're able to recreate um, all of the lighting conditions. And uh, there's some unique kind of shadows that are on the nozzle. Um, and if you blow a certain, you know, a certain light in a certain place, it'll cast a certain shadow. Right. So um, we're able to able to determine the exact location of of the failure point um, using these methods. And also, you'll see there's a few few sparks, and if you trace the trajectory of those sparks and then match it up with the light, and then of course, you know, this is all you know evidence piling on top of each other to you know to pinpoint a location, but. Very quickly, we, we knew exactly kind of where the general region had occurred. And as uh, the fidelity of that optical modeling got better and better, it actually, you know, pointed exactly to the place that we, we were, you know, we were kind of concerned about. And also it was being corroborated with other, other information. So once, once we determined where it was, which was on the fixed pack, um, a fixed high voltage battery pack, um, we we're able to kind of, you know, really focus our efforts there and, uh, and continue to, you know, dig deeper and deeper. And um, th this is where it gets kind of a little bit more more tricky in the fact that um, at the end of this conversation, everybody will be partial law and partial curve experts, but without having like a whole bunch of you know, partial curves been able to, to, to draw on a whiteboard and explain it, um, like, you know, it, it, there's a sequence, a number of sequence of events that all had to be true uh, for this to, to occur. And, and if you write them all down on a piece of paper, and we've kind of you know summarized them at the highest level possible you know for the most amount of human you know general consumption by by you know the average person possible but there's a lot lot of depth behind them but if you even if you wrote them all down you'd say well that's largely improbable like if you if you had a risk register you would go through all these things and and, and probably you know still still think that this is improbable but um but cut a long story short um so the partial law is kind of um, it's a unique phenomenon with respect to you know high voltages in space, so or in partial vacuums. And you know partial curve is 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 kind of a conjunction of of a number of things. You've got voltages, distances, pressures, and gases. And in, in a in a mix of certain conditions, arcs can behave very very differently. So you know I think in the earnings call, I, the best way I could describe it is if you take a battery at 500 volts down here on Earth, um, and you put the two terminals of those batteries at you know, positive and negative terminals of those batteries are 30 microns um, apart from each other. So one third of the thickness of a human hair, they still won't arc to each other and down on Earth. So you can, for all intents and purposes, you've got to touch them on Earth to get an arc. Right. Um, now in space, that same 500 volt battery, the same positive and negative terminal, can jump, jump an arc nearly a meter under the right environments in a partial vacuum with the right gases. Wow. So. Oh. Um, a whole meter. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy, yeah, whole meter. It's a crazy, crazy phenomenon. And you can go to, you can go to, you know, Wikipedia and look up partial curve, and you can see kind of a real simplified partial curve. Um, the reality is they look nothing like that when you actually start to overlay a whole bunch of stuff on them. But, um, but that you get the general, general gist of it. Um, right. So at very, at a very partial vacuum in certain gases, especially it's aggravated. Um, then you can form form these big, big arcs. Now, with electron, of course, at stage separation, um, the rocket gods wouldn't be so kind to us. They've put us in the worst part of the partial curve possible at that very point in time, where the battery voltage is at its highest, of course, because the batteries right. are, are, are full. Um, so what that leads to is, is, is basically all the high voltage looms in electron have to be hermetically sealed. So you can imagine that one pinhole in, uh, in any of those high voltage connections can you know, you can jump an arc to nearly a meter. So if you've got a pinhole in one of those things um, and anything around it is a meter away, then you can, in theory, at least jump an arc. So we go through extreme levels of testing here. And in fact, we take the whole second stage back in, stick it in a vacuum chamber, pull it down to these partial vacuums, inject it with argon to try and aggravate it. Um, but it's just a really, really hard thing to try and simulate because, um, you know, the various gases have, have quite a big effect. So, you know, in, in that particular flight, we had, um, we had trace amounts of helium, um, which, is, which is normal. And we obviously had nitrogen because we purged the interstage with nitrogen. So we had a helium-nitrogen kind of mix. So there's, you've got some kind of aggreg aggreg aggravating, um, you know, uh, gases there. Um, and then we have the high voltage batteries. And then on top of that, um, because they're a, a DC, um, you know, brushless 
uh, motor, sort of a synchronous motor, we get an AC ripple on top of the DC line. So though, although it's 500 volts DC, we get, we get you know, an AC ripple on top of that 500 volt line, which is also uh, an aggravating factor for a partial curve. So if you have 500 volts DC, uh, it might jump a meter. If you have 500 volts AC, then that distance increases once, once again. And you've got to dig real deep to find this kind of literature. It's, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's, it, and a lot of it we, we kind of derived experimentally. But, you know, so you've got, you've got a trace gases and then you have an AC ripple over the top. Clearly there's a, you know, a, 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 there's a, the tiniest imperceivable fault in, in the insulation. And then where that fault in the insulation is, depending on where, where that is, um, can also have a, a big effect to the probability of an arc being able to, you know, deform and, and, and go, go to ground or go, go, to, go to chassis. Um, and and a few other a few other things along the way, but that that ultimately you know all those things line up um, in a very transient moment because the moment we ignite the second stage, the battery volt, voltage drops and it gets us into a better part part of the partial curve. And of course, as we climb, we click, quickly climb into a much harder vacuum, so we don't have so much partial pressure. So we we actually climb ourselves out of the partial curve. So, in a very specific set of conditions, in a very specific point in time. Um, we were able to to have all of those things align, and um, and ultimately, you know, the, the end result was was an arc which which pulled the bus voltages down, and then there's no there's no coming back from that. Right. That is, I mean, first off, thank you so much for the the color there because that is absolutely fascinating. And I made like a mental note in my head. Oh, ask about the gases, and you you took us through the gases. I didn't even have to ask. So that is like the level of detail is super appreciated. It is, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it's as someone who, for whatever reason, uh, devours like industrial accident. Um, media or just you know striving to learn you know how do these things happen it sounds like a classic sort of swiss cheese model situation where it's all of these oh, yeah. separate things had to line up to make this happen and it could only happen at, a, at that exact point in time at that exact pressure that's that's wild um and and just props to to you guys in the, at the team there for using lighting and the trajectory of sparks uh, to to figure out where on the vehicle I mean, that's just, I don't know. I'm geeking out hard over here. That is absolutely fascinating stuff. I was super cool because the guy who did all the, the lighting work, we, we kept him segregated from the investigation team. So he had no idea where the area that we were looking was. So, you know, it was a completely independent um, uh, and isolated, isolated kind of project. And, um, you know, it was, it was about a week or so in, and we had, we'd already identified this area as the most probable when he came in and presented his results. And it was bang right exactly where we were looking. It was super cool to see that collaborated. Yeah, it's obviously unfortunate to have an anomaly, but I mean, it's, it's amazing to see what uh, a bunch of smart people in a room or two separate rooms can, uh, can derive. That's absolutely fascinating. So mm. an, the anomaly investigation is wrapped up. You have a cause. What are the what are some of your mitigations for uh, for this anomaly? Yeah. So the first thing to do is is kind of increase the testing even further. Um, so um, you know n now we have some new instrument in the new instruments in the vacuum chamber, and we're, we're able to you know measure electrical potential field down to the picocoulomb now, which is you know is 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 crazy accurate. So basically, if there's there's any breakdown in any insulation anywhere, we, we start to you know see partial fields um, occurring in the chamber, and you know the teams come up with um, some pretty clever ways to triangulate that to you know find where where it might be because obviously you've got a, a big high voltage system. Um, it's no it's it's a good go no go, but it's also good to you know be able to pinpoint it. And so that that was kind of one thing, but. Really wasn't happy with that um, as as kind of the end result. Um, so uh, sometimes the best way to just uh, solve a problem is to delete the problem entirely. So um, it was a rather extreme solution, but essentially what we did is you know the upper stage um, is in a there's a battery frame around the upper stage engine, and we filled in all of the the panels around the battery frame and um, put a flexible boot up to the nozzle. And we now just are going to pressurize that whole bite, that whole area. So by pressurizing that area, it don't, area it only needs to be like to half a psi. Um, basically, it's like being back down on Earth. 
So there's no way you can jump an arc 900 millimetres or a metre. Um, you, you, you basically, you know, remove any of that, that, that kind of Martian law out of the equation anymore. It's, it's literally as it would be down on Earth. Got it. Wow. So, I mean, this is sort of what happens when you're on the, on the bleeding edge. You get these crazy edge cases, and you guys at Rocket Lab, you have the carbon fiber rocket, you have electric powered turbo pumps, you're doing things that nobody else is doing. So, uh, I mean, it's unfor- again, it's unfortunate to have the anomaly, but I'm super glad you guys were able to pinpoint the cause, do these mitigations, and you're going to be flying again soon here, uh, I believe by the end of the month with IQPS. Yeah, so the, the window opens at the end of end of November here and, um, and you know, uh, provided the customer's ready and we're happy, then, um, then we'll, we'll roll it out and go and fly again. So, um, so yeah, no, is the, the team's done an amazing job. Like, nobody's slept for weeks and weeks and, and um, just plowed on through it. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to, you know, to, to get to, you know, the causes. It's another thing to kind of implement pretty, pretty drastic, you know, corrective um, Corrective measures. Uh, it's it's non-trivial to uh, you know to to build a press system and and monitor that pressure in there and 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 you know create create that whole solution in, in this in this time frame and then go through all the qual testing and acceptance testing right. and and whatnot. So it's yeah it's a lot of people have really been really been busting hard to you know, to get all this done. Well, good on everybody that has been absolutely working their tails off to get this done. So. We have the return to flight coming up. Uh, we said the window opens end of November, but let's talk for a second about 2024. You guys have a lot of launches planned mm. for next year, do you not? We do. Yeah, look at yeah, that. No, it's a. Yep, yep, yep. No, um, uh, it's a busy year for sure. Yep. No, we're 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 very um, very happy with that manifest and um, that that uh, you know that that's a. A great place to be for the product. Excellent. Yeah, it's like something like tw- was it twenty? I think that's what I remember reading. Uh, twenty electron yeah. launches, or including the the haste uh, launches as well. Twenty two. Sorry. Twenty two. That. Yep. That's correct. And um, you know the you know electrons really cemented itself as as, as a great product and you know really you know reliable and, and great way to get to the particular orbits that you know rideshare just can't can't get you to. So, um, so yeah, no, it's really, it's really found its groove. And um, I know that there's, there's, there's a lot of commentary about, well, is, is small launch even a market and, and all of that? But, you know, you can see clearly there that, um, yep, it's, it's a market. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice little market. Um, and, um, you know, the product is well, well placed to do well in it. Excellent. Uh, so what is your... How do I put this? What is um, what do you have to do to enable twenty two like scaling up to twenty two launches? Like, what sort of limits you guys in turn? Is it pad turnaround? Is it stage production? Is it like some hard to or long lead time item, uh, like a piece of metal, like no niobium or something? Or like, what is what have you been doing to to enable that that increase in cadence? Well, I mean, you, we, we should start off with the premise that this production sucks. Like, it, it is, it's just really, really difficult, at, even at the best of times. Um, but, I mean, the, we have all the pads. Um, you know, there's two pads at LC, LC1. Uh, there's three clean rooms down there. There's a pad at LC, LC2 um, and, and clean rooms, two clean rooms there. So, it's, so, so all that kind of base infrastructure is there. The, the factory has been scaling. You know, the production team have been, been doing a great job. Uh, incrementally pulling down the you know the build rate, um, so you know the the the, the product is, is super mature. The, the manufacturing process is, is super mature, um, and you know we we kind of transiently hit the rate that we need to hit um, for next year. And next year is really just holding that rate um, all the way through the year, um, you know, and 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 delivering really. I mean, um, you know, this year the team uh, hit one fifteen rate, so that's you know one rocket every fifteen days. Um, and sort of hovers around that one in seventeen. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's not there's not isn't is not like you know um, unnatural things need to occur for us to be able to achieve that rate. Nice, very cool. 
All right, I think we have some questions from the community here. Sawyer, let's uh, let's do some questions, how about? Sounds great. Uh, so you were talking about in terms of the anomaly with the batteries, it's something that's relatively new. And that means, unfortunately, you're the guinea pigs to find the things that are wrong with it. But uh, TerraSpace is asking here, why is Electron's second stage powered by battery packs rather than other methods of power? So what's the benefit of using the batteries? Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a design decision that we made at the very beginning of Electron to have it electrically pumped. And um, it's probably not as obvious as, as everybody might think, but in a small launch vehicle, propellant residuals determine the success or the failure of a small launch vehicle. So propellant residuals on a big rocket are, are, are super important, don't get me wrong, but on a small rocket, like if you leave 30, 30 litres or 30 kgs of, of fuel or oxidizer behind, um, that represents a large portion of your, of your you know, propellant mass, oh, sorry, your, your, your payload mass. So um, residuals uh, mean absolutely everything on a small launch vehicle. So, um, you know, electrons, excuse me, quite unique in the fact that um, you know, we, we have a closed loop system. We have level sensors in both stage one and stage two. In fact, in stage one, we suck that tank 100% completely dry. Like, you know, we, we know where the propellant is in, in the tunnel as we're, we're you know, gurgling down the last few litres of it. Um, and of course, being electric motors, they're, they're able to load sense. So we, we use them both as you know, motors, but also as, as kind of you know, instruments. And as, the, as the, the head pressure comes off those, those, um, you know, those pumps, you know, the load profile changes and you can actually detect the onset of cavitation. So we suck that first stage 100% completely dry. Now, if you're doing that with a turbo pump and you, you, you know you, you deplete one propellant you know more than the other then that ends up in a bad day with the engine but also um, if you get cavitation you can explode the turbo pump and it, it ends up in a bad day so you know with the electric electric pump where we're constantly you know modifying the oxygen fuel ratio <clears throat> as as we're depleting the propellants to make sure both propellants deplete exactly perfectly on time and then we also load sense in them to make sure that you know we suck every every last little bit out so that's on the first stage, and on the second stage, we do the same thing. We have a closed loop level sensor, and we're mono, you know, modifying the oxygen fuel ratio exactly to, to make sure that those propellants, um, we don't deplete on one propellant versus the other. And you know, uh, it, it's super easy to have 100 kgs of propellant left over, and it's like, well, there's your payload, so you get nothing to orbit. And if you look at Electron as a size of vehicle for the amount of payload it lifts, it's actually a really, really tiny vehicle for the amount of payload that it lifts. So, um, you know, propellant utilization is, is, is the key for a small launch vehicle. And like we can just control that all in software um, rather than through mechanical means or, or having to, to do it with gas generators and ride the knife edge. It's, it's, it is the thing that makes that vehicle so good um, is, you know, is that, that electric pump. It's really unbelievable that you're able to get every last drop out of that to get that extra oomph for the payload. And uh, along those lines, uh, Safir was asking, with the changes that you've had to make after this anomaly, is that going to have any impact on either payload mass or the margins that you have in terms of fuel slash electrical with the vehicle? Yeah, yeah. So, th 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 I mean, this is the challenge. So I can say this now because I'm building a big launch vehicle and a little launch vehicle. And uh, a little, little launch vehicle is so much harder to build than a big launch vehicle. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the question hit exactly on the point. It's like every gram that you add is, is meaningful to, to the payload. Um, so to implement this solution, not only did we have to implement it, we had to implement it in, in, like in a no-mass way. So, you know, the team's done some pretty tricky way, tricky things to make sure that it really is a minimal mass. So, yeah, there'll be, there'll be like a couple of kgs hit to the performance of the vehicle, but um, certainly not, not, nothing that, that would, you know, cause us to, to have any, any kind of concern or, or inability to fly payloads. It's, 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 it's marginal impact. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is the challenge. And, you know, we, we have debates about, you know, can we afford the mass of another pressure transducer? And then, you know, on neutron, it's like, ah, oh, hell, just throw another 10 on it. And it, and it represents like 0.0000001% of the mass, whereas on electron, it's actually 200 grams is a meaningful amount of mass. It's amazing you're able to get as much out of that vehicle as you are. The electron is just, I love it. It's so cool. Jack, I'm going to geek out a bit and send it back to you for more questions. 
Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I freaking love Electron. It's such a cool machine. And I'm all for, you know, implementing modern technologies and new ideas in rocketry. It feels like for so long we've been stuck in the same old era. And it just it just feels good to have new stuff on the drawing board. Um, so props to... And Peter, just once again, thank you so much for mm. sharing, you know, all of these technical details. This is like the yes. exact sort of stuff that we hear like Sawyer and myself, everybody at NSF, and plus our audience, we love this sort of nitty gritty. So thank you for not holding back. Um, this is this is excellent. Yeah. Um, so we do have some community questions from our members. Thank you to our members for being members and helping us do what we do. So we did ask in our Discord for additional questions. Um, and mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about uh, cadence and how you're going to hit 22 next year. Um, but specifically, we have a question here about wallops. Um, are there more scaling up plans for wallops? Like, what what a uh, what do you see in the future for uh, launches from that place specifically? Yeah, well, the wallops pad was always intended to be like a a, a government pad um, where we do a lot of the um, you know the work for for a government customer who who doesn't necess necessarily want to get on a plane down to New Zealand. Um, and um, it requires some of the facilities that are that are, that are at Wallops. So um, you know, Wallops is is never intended to be like a super high cadence pad. That's why we have the two pads down in New Zealand, where we we have complete control over that launch range and that launch range um, schedule. Um, when you have to go and play with other people, then um, it, you know you lose some of that flexibility. Um, but I mean, you know, Wallops for us is is obviously where we're setting up uh, Neutron. So. Uh, you know the, the team is is flat out there. Um, you know, building pads and and starting to build infrastructure out there for Neutron. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a key site for us. But uh, for Electron, it it really is focused around launching some of those those government missions. Um, the haste missions generally will always go out of there, um, and um, and and that's 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 really what that pad was designed to do. Good deal. And we are going to talk about Neutron. Speaking of moving into the future with technology for rockets, uh, we're going to get to Electron mm. chat. Don't worry. I see chat being like, we love Electron. So we're, we're going to get there. But we, I just want to get through. We, we, I mean, Electron is awesome. We got to talk about Electron for a little bit first. What is uh, the status of your automated flight safety system certification? Is there any, any updates there? Certified. Yeah, no, excellent. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we we flew. Yep. So whenever we fly out of Wallops, we're we're flying on that AFTS system. So, um, so yep, that's that that one is behind us. That was excellent. a marathon. That was a marathon. A lot of red tape. A lot of red tape. Um, uh, but I think I think, you know, we we just on that particular project, it wasn't just about us. I mean, what we were trying to do with that is is make sure that. That there was a system available for, for everybody in the future because you know FTS or flight termination is is just such a massive massive thing um, and it consumes a huge amount of resources and takes a huge amount of time and is a huge barrier um, and so the you know the AFTS that we fly in Electron uh, it, it's it's certified for Electron right now but um, it's you know the, the idea with that is it's it's a commercially available AFTS system for everybody to use um, and you know NASA hold all the software so. Um, you know the pain that we we went through and others have gone through with flight termination is hopefully, you know, re reduced here going forward. I love that. And the red I tape. That. I gotta say, the red tape though, it, it's different from the red that's painted on the electrons that are reusable, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, reusable red. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sawyer. Um, cool. Let's see. We have a couple more of these, and then we will move right along. But I don't want to miss these. Uh, we have one. Here we go. Okay, this is a really interesting one. We've seen a lot of talk about rapid response missions in the small sat sector mm. lately. What mm. what is your opinion of of that as a market or you know, usefulness or not usefulness? How do you feel about the the whole rapid response um segment of the market? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of difficult for us because um that's just kind of every day for us. I mean, it's not unusual to uh, integrate a customer the night before and go, okay, the weather's good, team, and roll a vehicle out in the morning and fly it in the afternoon. Um, so, uh, you know, we look at the, the kind of rapid response and it's, and it's just like, this is basically what we do, um, you know, normally. 
So um, yeah, I, I think I think it's always um, I, I think it's I think it's a, it's a good capability to have, and I think it was you know it's a good capability to demonstrate. Um, but um, for us, it's just how we roll. Um, it's not it's not it's not new or different. It's it's just yep, we're launching Electron. Let's roll it out. Um, yeah, good deal. Um, let's see here. So you have Wallops and you have Mahia. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yep, near enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you have you have we're, these two launch sites. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, so do you ever have any plans to perhaps have another launch site? Maybe I mean I'm a West Coast guy. I have to ask. Maybe like mm. say Vandenberg. <laughs> so you're shaking yeah, his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, launch sites. I mean, th it sounds like an awesome thing to own, but they're just they're just literally money hoovers. Um, it costs a tremendous. They're always by the sea, so everything's melting all the time, and um, they just cost a tremendous amount of money to keep keep you know up you know up ticked and and ready to go. Um, so you know, the least number of launch sites, the better in in, in my books. Um, and look, we'll, we'll build a launch site where there, wherever there is a, we believe there's a market opportunity for us. Um, so, you know, um, if, if, there's, if it proves that we need a, you know, a US-based West Coast launch, then, then the market will, will drive us there and we'll go and build one. Um, you know, building a launch site for us is, is, is just no big deal. But, I mean, to have one, you know, they cost a lot of money to, to you know, to maintain and operate. So you're going to put that on the balance sheet you better make sure there's a business case for it right good deal um okay here's one how is ocean recovery of electron coming do you have any plans or are you are you at the point where you're ready to um refly a recovered electron yet you're still sort of gathering data yeah, so what's, what's go ahead Surprisingly good. Like the the base assumption that we had was that if a rocket touches the water, it's toast, and um, that that's a pretty logical and reasonable base assumption um, to, to you know to start with. So um, you know, hence the reason why we thought, well, let's not let it touch the water and let's let's grab it with the helicopter. Um, and of course, you know, we, we we ultimately splashed a whole bunch down, and. Um, and you know, as we splashed them down and, and recovered them and started bringing them back and pulling them apart, it's like actually, there's not that much we need to do here to make this waterproof and marinized. Um, and it kind of got to the point where, um, as much as you know, I'm, I'm an avid helicopter pilot and I love my helicopters, it became pretty obvious that um, if we we fish them out of you know with a small number of modifications, we can fish them out of the water, and um, and 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 refurb from from that. And it just it just makes it so much you know the operation so much more um simple to start with um and the kind of the cost in the refurb you trade it against the cost of the helicopter and it pretty well neutral so you know the economics wow. um stacked up um so we may as well we may as well just make it a little bit easier for ourselves but um really our focus has been on you know getting them back um getting getting through the wall getting um getting the trajectories right you know the team are, team are able to you know the end of the last one come down within 400 meters of its predicted location. Um, so for a passively guided launch vehicle, that's pretty pretty bloody good. Um, so we've got got that down, and you know, just just passively kind of bringing it through um, and re-entering it is was was really the hardest thing to do because, as you know, you know, a Falcon does a braking burn. Um, we don't do a braking burn. Um, so you know, keeping it keeping that that stage. You know, together um, and in good condition is is really the tricky bit. So um, you know, when, once we once we get it splashed down in the ocean, everybody sort of just wipes their brow and goes, "Phew!" And that that's the hard bit done. Um, so uh, now we're really focusing on well, how do we get it out of the ocean um, in various kind of weather conditions and whatnot um, without damaging the vehicle. So the team's you know, be spending a fair bit of time on kind of ingenious methods to to ensure that we um, you know we don't we don't ironically damaged the stage getting it out of the water even though it survived through this through all this heinous re-entry and and you know shoot deploys and whatnot um and right. i would say that uh a, a big a big big kind of point was being able to refly that rutherford engine um that was uh you know earlier earlier this year that was a that was a big deal um because that kind of was the last piece you know can 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 we really 
do this and not only just do it because you can do anything, um, can we do it economically? Um, so for the reusability program, the next big demonstration will be a you know a whole set of engines, so a whole you know first stage power pack set of engines, and then um, then then a you know refly of the the whole vehicle. But you know we're 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 plowing we're plowing forward with you know you know production rate and those kinds of things. It's it's a it's a nice to have, not a must have for us to you know, either reach you know both reach rate but also reach the point in our economic model that we need to be at. Got it. So I have to ask, when Electron splashes down in the ocean, does it then become mm. a marine asset? Because you have famously said uh, marine assets suck. Do they suck less now? They do. <laughs> well, so I tell you, the most amazing thing is we, uh, one of the early ones that we splashed down, it was in the water for probably, call it an hour. Um, generally, we get it out pretty quick. It was in the water for an hour. There was freaking barnacles on the engine. Those little, little, little like marine things um, attaching themselves to the engine in that, in that amount of time. It's like, you, you gift it to the sea and it automatically starts consuming it just instantly. And wow. that's why I hate marine assets is because you put a ship in the water and it's just dissolving in front of your eyes. It's just literally being consumed by, by, by everything around you. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Wow. Okay. So on record, marine assets still suck. Got it. <laughs> they do. They do. They're a necessary evil. Well, they didn't, I've, I've, I'll admit they're a necessary evil, but, um, but you know, um, I much prefer things in the sky than things in the water. Yeah, I'm right there with you, honestly. I've never been much of an ocean person, personally. I mean, it's, a be it's beautiful, yeah. but it's very hazardous, and it, humans are not meant to... Anyways, I digress. Sawyer, do we have any more uh, questions in the queue there? We absolutely do, and it does relate to uh, our marine assets here and uh, reflying them. So for the manifest for next year, I mean, first off, 22 missions, crazy. Second, uh, there was a mix kind of there of some that were denoted as uh, recoverable and some that weren't. Is there a reason they're mm -hmm. not all planning on being recoverable yet? Yeah, totally. So, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the vehicle is, is, is always, um, you know, performance is always uh, maxima, maximized one way or the other. Um, whether it's a single payload and we've added more, more you know, payloads to maximize the amount we're lifting or, or the trajectories, um, you know, it's, it's always, you know, we always, always consume the, the, the vast majority of the, the performances, the vehicle's performance. Um, and also, um, you know, as I say, some trajectories consume a lot of performance as well. So um, some of it is just based on, um, you know, what, what we're able to fly um, with the vehicle and then um, also, you know, prioritising the rate necessarily over, over reusability um, next year is, is important for us. So, um, and, and it, that manifest is, is kind of, as it stands probably last week, um, and the manifest changes all the time. It's literally like a giant game of whack-a-mole as customers, you know, because we provide a dedicated service, we fly when the customer's ready. So if the customer's not ready, then we don't fly. So we're always moving missions in and around and changing and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, that, that, that the manifest is a very dynamic thing. So some reusable vehicles will move forward or back and come in and out and haste will go all around. So, um, you know, but we, we, we keep a... Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a pretty dynamic, you know, game we have to play with the manifest. So I guess it's a long winded way of saying, don't be surprised if there's other reusable vehicles pop up or there's other stuff that pops up, you know, as as we go through the go through the year. I'm I'm excited. Uh, so we've seen now the reflown Rutherford engine. What's next in terms of the steps to reflying? an entire booster and Massimo wants to know when is the potential first reflight of a recovered electron booster? Yep, so um, the, next, the next major step is a full set of nine engines on the first stage, um, making sure that we get that, um, get that, that kind of milestone ticked off. And then the next, the next milestone after that is, yeah, it's a completely reflown booster. I mean, um, the, 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 the actual, you know, Tanks are a, a relatively, you know, low risk, low kind of uncertainty for us. The, the things that are high uncertainty, of course, are things like engines and, and avionics and, and those kinds of things. So, 
Um, I think I think um, you know, it, it, obviously it looks it looks like a complete rocket when you've got the you know the, the tubes there, but the tubes by mass and complexity represent relatively small you know small portion of it. And you know we've been reflying re um, you know equipment on a number of vehicles, whether it be um, you know press systems or vent relief systems. So um, you know there've been a number of vehicles gone up um, with with reflying components on it as we as we kind of go through that. You know, refurb, inspect, refurbish, and refurb, um, and then reintroduce into production. So maybe sooner than later. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, it it kind of it kind of depends. Um, it depends on a number number of things because those reusable vehicles we have to. But the number one priority is getting customers to orbit on time when they want, and um, so that that drives everything. And then um, you know. When, when we've got reusable missions, they you know, and we can do them, we do them. Um, but if if a customer has a particular requirement to be on orbit in a particular time, and it's not a reusable vehicle, you know, we're not going to push that customer away. And so that 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 that's really the priority for us. Gotcha, Jack. I'll throw it back to you. I one of the things I lament very frequently on our streams is the shortness of human lifespan and bear with me i'm going somewhere with this mm. and that is because i want personally to gather as much knowledge about this universe that we live in as possible in the solar system that we live in and i wish we could send like very well appointed probes to every planetary body and then some and therefore learn more about our place in this amazing universe so Rocket Lab, and I think you in particular, uh, you have a, an affinity for Venus, and Rocket Lab has sort of a a uh, a mission on the books to send a probe to Venus. Do we have any um, sort of updates with how that's how the development of that's going? I know it's kind of like a it's not like the main priority; it's kind of like a you know a side thing. But um, I would love to hear more about what's going on with your Venus mission uh, and maybe any difficulties you've encountered um, mm -hmm. and, and how that's all going. Yeah, so the, the, the Venus mission is most definitely like a nights and weekends um, project, um, you know, and it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a rocket lab project, but also we have a number of team members um, on board as well. And it's nights and weekends for them as well. I mean, you know, we have NASA providing the, uh, the, the heat shield for the, the reentry probe. Um, you know, we have Sarah Sega and, and her team um, on the science team. Um, we have another group that have, have designed and built the instrument, which is it, which you know it's a it's a nephlometer. Um, and um, so there's you know it, it's a nights and weekends project kind of for everybody. Um, and you know as, as a result, you know if if I was if I was kind of retired, then I would just make that my job. But um, you know we've got actual customers to fly and, and actual spacecraft to build. Uh, but nevertheless, the project's uh, still going well, and you know it's based off the capstone um, photon uh, deep space um, spacecraft. And then there's, the, there's, a, there's a, a unique probe that's that's on the top. And kind of to your point, um, you know, if you if you if you look at everything else uh, around you, it has lifespans that measure thousands of years to millions of years. I think it's it's a cruel, cruel thing that a human is is really. A useful human is probably what I don't know. Six, Sixty years is useful. Yeah. Maybe maybe that that's a bit unfair. Um, but it's it, you look everything else around you, even just like like a piece of wood, and yep. it goes longer. So it's it's a ridiculously short amount of time frame to get anything done. Um, and and you know for me, um, the biggest the biggest one of the well probably the biggest question I have is like, are we the only life in the universe? And that stems back from the youngest memory I have, or space memory I have as a child, was standing outside uh, looking at the night sky with my father, and him pointing out that those were all stars in the sky, and those stars could have planets around them, and on those planets could be somebody looking back at you. And for, for like a four-year-old kid, that was that was that was like wow. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, now I, now I know what I'm doing with my rest of my life. Um, there we go. That was sorted. Um, but uh, but I think you know I think it's a really important question to answer either way because right. if we want to take a pure sci scientific method um, in the absence of any evidence um, for all intents and purposes at this point uh, we are the only life in the universe um, now I, I don't particularly believe that to be true but with in, in the lack of any evidence um, that's the only logical assumption you can draw 
Right. So if you could if you could go to go to if you could pr- go to somewhere and prove that there was you know actual life, then um, then I think that that changes your view on the universe pretty substantially. And Venus has this really interesting place. It's about fifty kilometers altitude in the clouds, where um, the environment is kind of non bad enough, um, where you could have potential for, for life. And of course, uh, you know Sarah Seeger and, and her team's work, um, you know, finding some phos- traces of phosphine really, really supercharges that theory. So the whole point of this probe is to is to enter the the, the atmosphere of Venus. We get about one hundred and twenty seconds. Um, and you know the instrument team have come up with an intru- instrument that is basically you know a go no go gauge for life. Um, if it's there, it will be. It's it's like digital. If it's there, it's yes. If it's not, it's no. So we're not we're not necessarily going there to you know to to make hugely in depth um, scientific measurements and and feed a lot of data back. Which you know there'll be a lot of data that comes back, but primarily it's like. You know, optimize the instrument for for really really looking for you know for phosphine and, and and detections of life. So we get about 120 seconds before the probe's crushed and melted, and um, you know it'll it'll be a red light or a green light um, at the other end. And um, you know e- either way, um, you know if it's, if it's a green light, it's like wow, well, um, obviously we need to 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 go back again and prove it some more. But if we if we take it as a green light, then um, then you know, if if life has has been able to you know survive and and thrive in that environment, then chances are actually life is prolific throughout the universe. And if it's a red light, then you know we best stop fighting with each other for a little bit longer because um, you know there's 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 kind of a little bit life's a little bit more precious than we than than we thought. So e- e- either way, I think it's um, I think it's 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 a super important and exciting thing to do. And we've kind of reached the point with both electron and photon that we can do this for, you know, a tiny amount of money. Um, and uh, you know, if we if we can if we can do more of these kinds of missions. To your point, I think everybody is 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 um, you know is, is much better for it. Absolutely. I mean, I I always say it: more data, more better. More science, more better. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it becomes a sort of a joking phrase at this point, but I really mean it because the more we can learn about our place in this amazing universe the better off i think we all are um fantastic so to you you were just saying um you know you have some ideas for for future things you could do and obviously the venus mission as a Mm. like sort of weekends and and side project kind of thing it's not like um you know that's your priority in that realm at this time but when you guys are like Mm. hanging out around the water cooler or in the break room or having a beer at the bar or whatever uh do you ever like chit chat you know like Man, but after Venus, we should do this. <laughs> like, do you do you have any like wild like things you've thrown at the oh, dartboard? That's called entrepreneurial drift. You've got to be careful with that. Um, <laughs> yes, scope yes creep. No. Uh, yeah, it's scope creep. Yeah, yeah. No, Venus is a is a big enough a big enough thing to really focus on. But I mean, look, um, the cool thing is that that you know with the photon that you know, the deep space photon spacecraft is we can go anywhere that's kind of. You know, in that in that kind of near Earth regime, whether it be a comet or an asteroid or uh, you know Mars or Venus, whatever, we can sort of stooge around our solar system, which is which is a super cool you know capability. And you know, we have um, we have the Escapade missions that we're we're building for NASA at the moment. Um, those are two two missions that are going to orbit Mars next year. So um, you know, we we love building those interplanetary spacecraft and doing that doing that work. Um, I think you know the whole team has a has a real deep passion for um, you know exploring our solar system and our universe. Um, I mean, uh, I, I would I would love to to to, to go deeper as well. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the Voyager probes are super cool, but um, you know, let's get some stuff way out there. And and um, I think it, yeah, with it's there's a, there's a lot to learn for sure. Amazing, awesome. All right. Well, I think we're about the point where we should move on and start talking about Neutron, your reusable vehicle that you have in the works. But first, I do want to sort of ask this question and bear with me here. Mm. Rocket Lab has like the best and most impressive cadence of all small sat launchers. I think that's a slam dunk. That's super fair to say. And it just shows in what you all have been able to do. Other small sat companies and other vehicles have significantly worse track records you know some have gone out of business some are struggling do you think there's something sort of inherent 
to launching small satellites and having such tight mass margins. I mean, it's like you were talking about earlier with every kilogram of propellant counts. Do you, do you think that something about launching small satellites um, is, is harder that, that makes electrons current reliability record sort of the maximum achievable? Do you think you guys can do better? Um, Mm -hmm. What, how do you, how do you see that? Yeah. I mean, we can always do better. I mean, um, reliability is number one. So, um, so you can always, you can always do better. Um, there, there is kind of uh, a paradox with the small launch vehicle in the fact that, um, you know, you, you have, you have a $7.5 million sticker price and you have to amortize all of the people over and all of the, 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 the processes over a $7.5 million sticker price. If you've got a, a $60 million sticker price, um, then um, you, you, you've got a much bigger team to amortize. And, you know, just take pick on one team, like the flight safety team, for example. Um, we can't afford to have like 30 people um, running all the trajectories and building all the flight safety products and, um, and submitting all those to FAA and, um, and all that. Like, we just can't afford 30 people to do that. We need like three people to do that. So what that drives you to is just incredible efficiency, um, automation, and, and just being really, really smart. Um, so in, in just in, in that simple way, it's so much harder to build a small launch vehicle as a business than it is a large launch vehicle, for sure. And then, you know, there's, there's a physics of it where, you know, every, not everything scales, like, you know, if we talk about a pressure transducer, well, that's a real thing. Like a pressure tra- transducer only goes so small. Um, and so at some point, like everything only goes so small. So those things start to attribute meaningful to, you know, to the meaningfully to the mass of the vehicle. So from an engineering right. perspective, it's, 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 it's much more difficult. Um, so it really is, if, if, you can, if you can pull off a small launch vehicle with a high cadence and high reliability, a large launch vehicle is a piece of cake. I mean, and, you know, I made the comment before, it's so much easier to build a big rocket than it is a little rocket. Um, well, that, 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 that is, there's a truism in both um, uh, the actual vehicle itself from the engineering through to, um, you know, th- through to the, the, the operational and, and the business model. It's just, it's just way, way easier to do. But I mean, um, the thing is that small dedicated launches is, is absolutely required, and it's it's a it's a really important market niche, um, and uh, and all the rest of it. Um, but um, you know, the the other thing I think is is true is the thing that makes a hard makes a, a big launch vehicle difficult is not so much engineering; it's capital. So for a small launch vehicle, you can build a launch site, and it doesn't cost you that much because there's not much concrete in the ground, and there's not much steel in the ground. Um, with Neutron, the real challenge with Neutron is not necessarily the engineering. It's just the quantum of capital and the quantum of infrastructure you have to build to make that successful. That's why all rocket companies, um, probably bar none, start off by building a little launch vehicle first, and then they move to a big launch vehicle. Because to just go straight to building a big launch vehicle, you don't have the credibility um, to raise the, the level of capital that is required to actually go out and just straight out build a big rocket because it's, 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 it's just enormous. I mean, like I say, that is the hard bit about a big rocket is, is, is the capital, not necessarily the, the engineering. Certainly the business model is, is, is far easier to, to close than, than, than a small rocket. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. Um, all right. Well, fantastic discussion right, so far. You... I... Oh, go ahead. Did I actually answer? Did I actually answer your question there or not? I kind of got off on my own no, little track there, and I wasn't sure if I'd answered your question. You, you did. Um, I just, yeah, I, I think we'll 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 leave that one there, and we'll uh, we'll move to to Neutron because, as you said, it's common to build a smaller vehicle first, and then uh, and then go on to a larger vehicle, and lo and behold, Rocket Lab is doing the same with Neutron. So. It's currently in development. Uh, in, in October, you guys posted the footage of the structural testing of the second stage mm. tank, um, which, which pushed to, uh, to the maximum operating pressure in that test. Uh, so where, where is the current status of uh, Neutron's development, and, and how do you see all that going? 
Yeah, sure. So we, let's talk about that tank test at the, at, to, to begin with, because I think that's um, that's a way bigger milestone than I, I think probably people realise. Because you know, when when you have the you know the, the second stage tank up there, so the second stage is the most difficult stage to build a neutron, um, because it's 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 literally like a paradox in the fact that it has to be the lightest, highest performing structural vessel, um, and also needs to cost the least because that's the only part of the vehicle that is disposable. Right. So you end up with these, the, you know, you end up with the most challenging economic and engineering problems. And so, you know, if you can successfully build that second stage tank, you look at the first stage tank and it's got heaps more margin and, and you know, it's way gruntier and, and, and all the rest of it, it's, it's, it's a piece of cake. So that's, that's the reason why we really focused on the second stage first is because, you know, do the hardest thing first. So, you know, to get to the point getting a frosty tank and, and then, you know, MEOP and then, then actually, you know, to failure is, is a huge milestone because what, what that essentially means is that, you know, we met those te test objectives, um, is that all the material science and all the material work is done, all the, the you know, the, the manufacturing, um, you know, of, of the tank and, and it sort of doesn't show it in the images, but that thing's freaking big um, and, you know, it's five metres in diameter, it's, it's really big. Right. Um, and you know it's it's a large composite structure. Um, that that's really hard. And you know the way that the neutron is is architected is it's a it's kind of a, a hung tank. So there's no structural load path through the tank. It's kind of hung in, hung inside the first stage. Right. So you know that tank. You know, most people don't believe me when I say that tank weighs the same amount as as a Harley Davidson. Like it's three hundred and something kgs. That tank. It's nuts. It's so so incredibly. <laughs> It's wow. so, so light. Like, you know, the Centaur is an amazing upper stage, but you, you imagine like the, the, you know, a Centaur carbon fiber is, is, is one quarter of the density of stainless steel. So you get a sense of how, you know, and, and stronger. You see, you get a sense of how, just how incredibly light that tank is. And um, that's what gives us the low cost because there's almost no material in it. And it gives us the incredible performance of the upper stage of, of the vehicle. So, so that, 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 that tank is, is really, really something else. It's, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a really big milestone to hit. So now we look at the first stage tank and, and like I say, it's you know, much thicker walls and real grunty because it's got to go over and over again. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, this isn't so hard now. So, um, yeah, so that, that, was, that was, a, was a big milestone for the team. And then, you know, more generally, um, look, it's a rocket program. And I would say we're, we're in the honeymoon period where, um, hardware's coming together, and like we're, we're getting right down and, and dirty into the, the, you know, the big testing. And you know, it's always cool to have hardware turn up. And and of course, you look at it and you go, oh, "It's going to be amazing. It's going to work perfectly." And then you go out to test, and it's like, "I actually know that didn't work perfectly. So we need to go back and fix that." So, you know, I, I call the call this to the whole team is the honeymoon period. We've got lots of hardware, and now we're breaking it all, and we're truly learning what we got right and what we got wrong. What has enough margin? What doesn't have enough margin? And then when you combine certain systems together, what works and, and all the interaction, you know, the various interactions of those systems. So, um, so it, yeah, this year has gone, gone, gone really well. I'm really proud of the team and, and, and how much we've, we've kind of chugged through. But uh, next year is a big year for sure. Make no mistake. That's super exciting. I'm still trying to process the weight of the tank being so light. I mean, I know it's, it's carbon composite. But yeah, that's that's utterly wild. Um, I have a personal question, just kind of because I'm maybe because I'm because I'm just dumb. But so the tank is hung inside mm. the the vehicle. How what is the yep. load path for the payload? Um, does the payload go to like a structural point mm. on the vehicle itself, and then thus the tank uh, doesn't have to to bear that that load during during liftoff and launch? Or like, how, how does that work? Yeah, so um, there's a there's a payload cone not not dissimilar to um, to a normal launch vehicle, and that that payload that payload cone comes quite a, quite quite far out to the you know the top of the tank um, top of the tank dome and wall. So yes, the, the you know the, the the actual payload goes down and couples in for the in, in the very top of the tank down to kind of the you know the, the ring main if you will around that around the top of that stage. But the the load path is super super clean. Uh, it's the most nice. beautiful load path. Um, it's kind of like you, you stand in front of a whiteboard and then draw the ultimate load path, and and then that was the basis for starting, you know, the you know the design of the vehicle, and um, you know because in order to in order to make the vehicle as reusable as possible, as I think everybody knows, we we hold the fairings on the first stage, 
um, right. and and we bring those fairings back down on the first stage. So, um, you know, that is that is a really parasitic kind of you know performance thing to do. Um, so you you know you, you have to find other ways to you know to make it up to make the rocket equation close um, because as you come up with all these great ideas to make reusable launch vehicles and they sound all cool and then you do the maths and it's like you get 100 kgs to orbit. Um, so you know it's it's all it's all a giant kind of trade off. So if you look at our first stage compared to our second stage, like the first stage looks giantly oversized to the first to, to the second stage. And and that's that's because you know we're bringing a lot home on the first stage, and we're making sure that first stage is good to go on again and again with minimum amount of refurb. So you know it, it's just all a big engineering compromise about where you put the margins and where you put the performance. Yeah, I am glad that all I have to do is operate cameras and talk to people because the amount of trades <laughs> you have to deal with in rocket development it, it's just like the most insidious puzzle I could possibly think of. Um, so you said uh, next is, year. Go yeah. ahead. Oh no, it is. We we call it the spiral of doom because um, <laughs> basically, you know, you'll 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 be a little bit underperforming, right? So because of some structural, some some inert mass, some parasitic mass, so you need to add a little bit more propellant, um, you know, to, to you know to, to null out that mass, and then you add a little bit more propellant, so you have to add a little bit more tank, and you've added a little bit more tanks, so you have to add a little bit more propellant. And you know you very quickly can run off into into areas where the, it just doesn't close. Like you right. get nothing to orbit or, or negative payload margin. So you, you got to be you know yeah. Like I say, it's it's just one giant engineering compromise. Like you know that you've done your job right when every engineer is unhappy because <laughs> if somebody's happy, then they got they got too much. I love it. Uh, I mean, there's a reason they call it rocket science, right? Um, so you said next year is a big year for Neutron. So mm. what are your next stages of development? You've tested the second stage tank. What's coming up next for Neutron? Well, there's more tanks in development, more in, in more upper stage tanks, um, you know, to, to roll through the qual programs, uh, first stage tanks as well, to roll through the qual programs. Um, probably the longest pole in the tent is propulsion. Um, it's always propulsion. Um, I would have said that um, probably the upper stage tank was one of the highest risks, um, largest amounts of development. Um, hence the reasons why you, you, you know, you've seen that, seen that kind of been prioritised. Right. So um, that that's a that that's that that's a good one, to, a good monkey to have off our back. Um, right. But look, Archim Archimedes as an engine is, um, you know, it's 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 going super well, and uh, the whole point with Archimedes is is to you know get it to such a benign operating point. That you know you really don't have to to think too hard about flying it again and again and again, and I liken it to like you know if you're sitting in an aircraft and you're looking out at the, the gas turbines on the wind on the wing, you you know you don't expect them to be running at at the point where uh, you know you're not quite sure if it's if it's it's going to do the next flight. So we picked we picked kind of operating points and cycles and and operating points in the cycles to really maximize the kind of performance we need, but you know, ended up in, in, in like these really, really benign operating points. So, you know, you go to, to you know, a close combustion cycle, um, that's generally associated with super high performance engines with crazy high, you know, combustion chamber pressures, and you're trying to squeak every last little bit of performance out of the engine. Well, we went to that cycle, not for that reason at all. We, we went, to that, went to that cycle really because we, we if, we, if you just dial that back a bit, then you end up in a pretty benign, well, you actually end up in a really benign operating point um, at the same kind of level of performance as, say, a GG cycle. So you take a like an ox rich closed cycle and operate it at GG pressures and, and, and GG, mar GG performances, and, and then you end up with this thing that's, that's kind of you know, really, really bulletproof. So, um, and, and that's been kind of funny because as we've been doing pre-burner tests, um, you know, obviously we're flying all the oxygen um, through the combustion device, um, and you know, generally you're doing that at wickedly high pressures. And we're like, nah, this is back backed way off. So um, you know, you end up with new problems like um, extinguishing the, the, the flame because it's it's just operating point is just too benign, um, and and now we're having to solve some of those problems there. So, um, but yeah, um, that 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 still remains. You know the long pole in the tent, and you know the teams the teams crashing through it. But um, but I think you know 
we, we're trying to build the most boring, unboring engine, if you will. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, and just for our audience, uh, GG is gas generator, which is a you know a different cycle of of a rocket engine. That's man, I <laughs> I could nerd out on this for so long, so fascinating. Uh, but I won't. I'll spare our audience that and you, Peter Sawyer. Do we have some <laughs> more questions that we want to ask? We absolutely do. And for a second, I thought it was a good game. But anyway. Um... <laughs> Adam J wants to know here, um, how many launches per year are you hoping to get with Neutron? And obviously I'm guessing that's going to be scaled up. So what's the hope in terms of how many launches per year and when you get to that full cadence? Yeah, I mean, I'd be hesitant to put, put kind of a number on that because, um, you know, every, every time you do, I just turn out to be wrong. So um, what I will <laughs> say is the, the, the kind of the, kind of the, the, the the initial cadence is following the same model that we did with Electron and, and I think that everybody else has with a new new launch vehicle. Um, and, you know, uh, one and then three and then five and, you know, kind of slowly, slowly building, building into the cadence. I mean, you know, it, it, it should be capable of reflying many, many times. Um, the kind of customers that we're talking to it, uh, talking to for the vehicle aren't, aren't really, you know, not looking to buy ones and twosies. It's like, um, you know, it's designed to be a mega, mega constellation deployer, really. So um, it's, it's designed for, for quite high rates. And, um, you know, we, we're, we, we're, we're kind of the conservative guys. And, um, you know, I think, I think it'd be ridiculous if, if I came out to you and said, well, in year one, we're going to fly it once. And then in year two, we're going to fly it 20 times. It's just like, you know, that's just not reasonable. So um, we'll step into our cadence um, and, um, and and take the learnings as we go through, but um, you know this is this is kind of second time around. So with Electron, we had to build all of the factory and production, the ERP systems, and all the boring stuff um, at the same time. And there's so much that's just directly you know come, flows straight across to, to to Neutron. It's like we don't have to invent a new ERP system or a new you know, a, a new work instruction system and a new production system, it's, it's, it's already there. So, you know, we're, we're already way, way, way further ahead. So I'd hope we'd do a better job. But um, at the end of the day, it is still a new launch vehicle and there will be, there will be kind of improvements and teething problems along the way. And that's just the reality of it all. Now, I, I hate to bring up marine assets one more time. I know how we all feel about it. Mm. Um, but Xbar is asking here, is Neutron's plan only to land back on land, or would there be potential for a drone ship for a more intensive launch or for a uh, higher launch cadence? And also, just what is the progress on uh, getting that first stage to that landable point? Yep. Um, so in, in the kind of original architecture, and, and this is where, you know, your engineering trades just come in, right? It, you know, it was a return to launch site was like, well, let's just return them all to launch site. Um, but actually, you know, that, that you, you, you chew a tremendous amount of performance to, you know, to do that. So, you know, uh, a Neutron RTLS is, is like eight ton payload, a downrange, um, you know, drone ship landing is 13 tons payload plus. So um, you know th there'll be there'll be certain missions where return to launch site makes makes sense, but from a kind of economic model, it's it's the, the baseline you know is to return back to a drone ship. So yes, we will have more marine assets, which um, I've I've you know kind of resigned to the fact of of uh, one way or the other. But I mean, it's just the most efficient way um, you know of 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 doing it. Um, you just you just trade out too much payload to do RTLS. I'm glad you didn't bet any more uh, edible articles of clothing on marine assets then. <laughs> no, no, I've learned yeah, a lesson on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard lesson to learn. Yeah. Jack, back to you. Cool. Um, so are there any plans for like sort of hop tests with Neutron or is your first mm. launch with Neutron just going to be sort of an all up, we're sending it? Yeah, no, we'll 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 just we'll just bring it home. Um, we'll try to. I mean, look, if if we hadn't had the experience with Electron, then then you'd go, yeah, no, it's there's there's a lot of a lot a lot we need to learn there. But this is this is kind of, you know, I think I've said it before. It's it, if if we hadn't gone through the process of of trying to reuse Electron, 
like trying to make a reusable launch vehicle with Neutron would just be an incredibly daunting task. And you'd have so many unknowns um, and known unknowns and unknown knowns that it would be, you know, it would be, it'd be really difficult. And you'd have to kind of, you know, chunk the problem up and to start breaking it off into, into various kind of different things. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the first time we've, we've, we've ridden the wave back through the Earth's atmosphere. So, you know, the learnings, you know, if, if nothing, like if nothing other than um, that those learnings comes from Electron's reusable program, it will be 1,000% totally worth it. Um, you know, from, from materials, from, you know, control algorithms, to understanding how vehicles actually inter interact with the atmosphere, to thermal protection systems, um, we've learned it all. So, um, oh, well, I'm sure there's more to learn, but you know, we've learned enough that that we'll just we'll just have a crack at bringing it straight in. Nice. Um, has there been a final decision on how many sort of halves or quarters the fairing on Neutron will have? I think we've seen sort of the the four pedal, and then we sort of saw the the Hippo Chomper. Um, any more thoughts mm. on, on the fairing <laughs> configuration there? Yeah, it's a hungry hippo for hundred percent. Yep. So it's two two halves. Um, we originally started off with the with the flower, the four, um, but um, but we changed it pretty quickly to, as we got into the you know detailed engineering design um, into the hungry hippo. Um, and one thing we did learn is um, earlier this year is we just made a whole bunch of progress on the vehicle over the last sort of year and a half. And you know we we didn't put out any renders because well we didn't we just busy building a rocket. Um, and it wasn't until you know we actually put out a render and incorporated a whole bunch of the new stuff. Um, I think you know, all the forums and everybody kind of lit up. Like, oh, Neutron's gone through all these changes and all this. Well, I actually know we just we just haven't done a render. So we learned that lesson. We'll try and keep the renders a little bit a little bit more more current. But um, a lot of the stuff that was kind of new for a lot of people were like, no, that was that's like a year old. Um, right. So um, yeah. Good deal. I mean, I guess it's kind of more of a nauseous hippo because if it was a hungry hippo, it would be eating the pay. Anyways, um, <laughs> any plans for a reusable? Out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a burping hippo. Oh god. Are there any plans <laughs> for a reusable second stage for either neutron or electron? That's like one of the most devilish uh, problems, I suppose. Yeah, so I mean, it's just not that conducive. The rocket equations just doesn't. It's not that conducive to it, right? I mean, it's we 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 trade so much to keep the fairing on the first stage. Um, like putting the fairing on the keeping the fairing on the second stage, you just you just end up you know much much larger, and you know your payload just just suffers so so horrendously, and then you know heat tiling and reentries and and all those kinds of things, and then um, and then actually. You know you're in orbit now, so um, you actually you have to you have to you know time your orbital um, excuse me reentry point so that you land it back where you care. Um, like it's no point in just landing it back in in an African desert somewhere. You've you've actually got to land it back where you care. So you've got a you've got a whole you know reentry um, you know bit to deal with from from an you know orbital targeting you know standpoint, which is all doable. Don't get me wrong. Um, Never say never because I've learnt my lesson. But um, <laughs> at this point, at this point, we 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 kind of just focused on making um, a really efficient, uh, really high performance, and really low cost upper stage. Um, and you know, the reality is that seventy percent of the cost of the vehicle is in the first stage, and that's true with electron and and neutron. Like the vast majority of the cost is 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 in the first stage. So that's the obvious thing that that it makes the most amount of sense to you know to to, to try and reuse, um, and then uh, if if you can you can focus on the second stage and make it as as kind of affordable as possible, then 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 actually the economics start to get pretty fuzzy at that point. Um, so you know that that's one of the reasons why the second stage is hung inside the first stage is because as I said before, it doesn't have to carry the structural through load of you know of of the vehicle, and you know, there's no material in it as as a result, and if there's no material in it, there's no cost in it. Good deal. Awesome. Well, uh, Sawyer, do we have some more questions in the queue? And also, chat. If you have any more questions, now is the time to ask. Just at NASA Space Flight in chat, and uh, we'll see your questions pop up and maybe ask it. But Sawyer, what else we got? 
So we've talked about the reusability, we've talked about the second stage. The one thing we haven't really talked about yet is the launch itself. I actually got a question from a friend who's in New Zealand, uh, and he was wondering what the plan is in terms of the launch pads for Neutron. So are there plans to modify pads A and B, or is there a plan for maybe building a pad C? So what's the uh, launch pad infrastructure like for Neutron? Yeah, so uh, big. Um is the short answer to that. So uh, if you if you look at, there's some recent images of the amount of land we've cleared at, at Wallops Island to start building, you know, LC3, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, big pad. And um, so we'll start launching it out of Wallops. At this point, there's no, um, no, no plans to launch it out of New Zealand. Um, the reality is that if we take all of the liquid oxygen produced in New Zealand, um, we half fill a neutron tank once. So um, there's just not the industrial base to to kind of support that level of that level of project. Um, so hence the reasons why you know it's it's launched out of out of the states where we can just have you know whole whole line of tankers turn up and away we go. Um, so you know there's there's a there's infrastructure been starting to put in the ground at at, at Wallops, um, and you know we we really love the Wallop site. It's nice and quiet, um, and we don't have to we don't have to work around too many other any other folks. And um, we get nice trajectories there. It's actually a really, really sweet um, sun synchronous dog leg corridor, way, way better than the Cape. Um, you know, the Cape's sun synchronous dog leg is is, is pretty energy intensive. Um, uh, Wallops is is, um, is is a little bit better, so that's that's good for us. So yeah, we we really love that site, and it, you know that's where we're focusing um, Neutron on at the moment. And how has it been working with them over at the Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport and that whole area in terms of? planning for the RTLS side in addition to the launch side? Yeah, look, the state has been super supportive. Um, you know, the state's been, been, been great. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, Antares is, is winding up. Um, so, you know, the state was super keen. Um, and we built those relationships with, um, with Electron. So uh, we already have a team out there and facilities out there. So it was, you know, it's been, it's been super good. That's awesome. Now. I know I've seen people asking this, and I guess the question in the furthering of Neutron is, are there ever any plans to human rate it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're designing it to be human rated, human rateable, not human rated out of the, out of the gate. Um, and if you've got a vehicle with that amount of performance, it's silly not to kind of account for the one day of the ability to put a capsule on the top. So, you know, as we're going through the design decisions and the safety factor margining of things like tanks and whatnot, um, you know, that's totally, uh, you know, totally on the top of our minds. Um, now, as to when we would do that, I think, um, you know, at the moment, there is really no market for human spaceflight. There's, um, there's one customer, and that customer's, you know, well served. Um, so until there's like multiple customers in a real business case, then um, as cool as it sounds, um, you know, to, to run off and build capsules, um, I think that's, that's kind of the reality is, is there needs to be, you know, either more space stations or more more orbital destinations before um, you know we, you, you jump in and, and make an investment to that kind of scale. But the preparations are at least underway for that. Well, we certainly haven't ruled it out. Um, that's for sure, and <laughs> we're making sure that you know if if the opportunity arises, then um, then you know we're, we're well positioned to jump on it. Nice. Jack, I know All you have right. a few more questions as we're getting close to the end here. I do. We're coming into the home stretch. Uh, so, do you have a favorite launch? We're, we're transitioning out of Neutron a little bit here, just some more, more general mm -hmm. questions. Um, do you have a favorite launch that you've seen in person? Any, any launch, any rocket? Um, was there sort of a standout moment for you? Like, even... What was the first launch that you've seen? I guess I'm asking multiple questions now, but um, so the the first launch that I ever saw was the last shuttle night launch. Um, it was actually the first launch I ever saw. Um, and then my favorite launch is every successful one. Um, nice. <laughs> uh, and then um, probably one of the most memorable launches for me personally was. Um, it's uh, it was the, the NASA launch that we did, um, uh, the, the VCLS launch we did at the very you know early start start of the company, um, and um, 
For a number of reasons, you know, I think the launch was called This One's for Pickering, um, named after um, William Pickering, who was a New Zealander who, who helped start JPL. And it was just super cool because we had the Pickering family in Mission Control. And as a, as a kid growing up, you know, I used to watch NASA TV and, and, you know, for the longest time, my whole focus in being in life was to go and work for NASA. So to actually, you know, fly one of their payloads, you have a big meatball on the side of the rocket, was, was one of those pretty cool moments where, yeah, I didn't quite get to work for NASA, but um, in, 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 a, in a different way, um, still, got to, still got to live the dream. That's really special. And thank you for mentioning shuttle so that we can check that <laughs> off the, the NASA space flight checklist here. We have to mention shuttle, otherwise Crispy will get mad. And rightfully so. What an amazing vehicle. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so you said you said you had a meatball on the side. I So I have to ask this. Do you Are you a meatball or a, or a worm person, or do you not really care? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably, well, it, it, a bit of both. Um, I, I, I wouldn't swear allegiance to, to either one. Um, happy, happy either way. I mean, um, you know, on that VCLS mission, we had the meatball on the side. On the capstone mission to the moon, um, we had the worm. Um, so, you know, we're not, you know, we're not, we're ambidextrous on the, on, on the logos, <laughs> that's for sure. And okay. I think part of the reason why we had the worm, though, is we had, we had, we had no, we had no kind of performance left in the vehicle. That, that capstone mission to the moon was the craziest flight ever. And, and there was like a three hour debate whether or not we could afford the mass of the sticker on the side of the vehicle or not. Um, so, you know, in the end, in the, in the end, probably the worm was slightly lighter. That's probably how it got on there. Nice. <laughs> I love it. I love that answer. Um, let's see here. Sawyer, do you have anything uh, jumping out at you? Uh, yeah, one thing that you mentioned earlier that someone also brought up was the fact that you were talking about the whole idea of being designed to build constellations. You know, to help with the launch mm. of satellite constellations. Uh, is there any role for photon in that, do you think? Uh, well, yeah. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about rockets today, but two thirds of our business is actually space systems and building spacecraft. So, um, you know, we have, obviously, we have um, the Escapade mission we talked about where we're going to Mars. Um, we have the VARTA missions, um, one of them's on orbit right now, um, soon to be deorbited. Um, so that, that's quite unique in its own right. Um, then we have the, the MDA Global Star constellation. So we're actually, you know, building uh, you know, constellation class spacecraft. And these are um, little ones, you know, they're, they're, the solar wings are 10 meters in, in, in length and the actual, you know, core of the bus is about the size of a mini. So these, these are pretty significant kind of spacecraft. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole kind of goal of Rocket Lab is, is to be an, an end-to-end space company. And so, you know, launch is super important. It's, it, it gets all of the headlines and, and all of the fun. Um, and it's super hard to do and it's super rare, which makes it super valuable, which is, which is great. And, you know, if you don't have launch, then you don't have the keys to space. Um, and having the keys to space is, is super important. But our view is that it's launch is just one element um, of an end-to-end space company. So, you know, having launch is good. Being able to build any spacecraft that you want to build is good. Um, but really, uh, the big prize is is putting infrastructure in orbit. And I think you know, that's become very obvious for everybody that if you if you can build whatever satellite you want to build and you can launch it uh, using your own rocket, then you're it's it's, in, it's incredibly hard to uh, to compete or or you know to beat that as a, as a as a business model, and we're kind of you know gently and methodically stepping our way through um, to that ultimate endpoint. Awesome, Jack. All right, well we got like three minutes left here. I know you're a super busy guy, so we want to respect your time. But just really quick, thank you again for sharing your knowledge and your passion with us. It's this has just been so delightful. Um, but I, I just want to, you know, is there anything that we haven't hit in this discussion that you'd really like to talk about? Or is, is there something, you know, basically what, like, what have we, what have we not asked about that we should have? I always like to ask a question like that. Oh, you guys are super generous. Like you don't throw anything curly at all. It's, it's, it's all very easy. So, um, uh, no, I think, I think we've covered off, um, covered off the majority of, of kind of, of stuff um but 
yeah, no, like I say, I appreciate the opportunity to, to chat and, and um, yeah, super, super easy questions. Absolutely. All right, well, that means next time we'll have to have some harder ones for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I was just keep waiting for the big curly ones, but they just never come. Uh, oh, man, well, now I feel like I've disappointed you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man, no, no, no. so... So the road to Neutron is ahead of you, and you're returning to flight with Electron. Um, how do you see the next two years going, and how do you ensure Rocket Lab um, is able to continue and make it through the next two or three or so years? Because like we were talking about earlier, we've seen other small sat companies struggling. Yeah. I mean, space launch is not easy. How, do you, how does Rocket Lab survive the next two years? Yeah, see, that's a much better question in that respect. So um, you're exactly right. Um, like this, 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 this is hard. This is super hard, and and launches launches really hard. And I, w I would say that the industry has suffered um, uh, from a lot of aspiration and not a lot of execution. And what we're witnessing right now is the weeding out of the aspiration versus the execution. And, um, and, and Rocket Lab is not immune to that. We, we, we have to execute as well. Um, but I think, you know, the one thing that, that, you know, that we are really rigid on, and from both culturally and, and, um, and just, just it's in our DNA, it's like everybody at this company gets measured, did you do what you said you were going to do? And I expect everybody to measure us, you know, did you do what you said you were going to do? And that's kind of the core of, of you know the the company really the culture of of the company, so um, you know we're we're probably not the the best marketing people though we have great marketing people Morgan and team fantastic job but you know what I mean we 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 we're, we're probably not the best at at pumping pumping everything up and and whatnot um, we just sort of quietly go about executing stuff and you know as a public company we have to be a little bit more public about the things we do but I'm sure that you can. You can remember a number of times in our history where we've just done something and then we talk about it. It's like right. you know, we launched Surprise, we just put a satellite on orbit and a school photon, and you know, you know, there's, there's there's a bunch of stuff throughout throughout the company's history where where we just sort of quietly go about and, and execute. And I think um, that's super important for us. Um, you know, the next couple of years are are important years, but fundamentally, um, you know, one of the one of the reasons I took Rocket Lab public. Um, was, you know, ultimately I'm trying to build a multi-generational enduring space company. Um, and, you know, um, this, this company can't be like the Peter Beck show because, you know, to our discussion before, like everybody has a use-by date, um, either, you know, either forced or unforced. So right. um, uh, when, 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 when it's, you know, when they put me in the ground, the definition of success will be, you know, a thriving and successful, you know, rocket lab continuing on. And by going public, you kind of enforce that to happen because you, you, you have to be, you have to, you have to be profitable. Like if you want a company to, to live on, you know, in, in prosperity and in, in, in the future, you have to build something that's actually profitable. Um, and you have to, you know, deliver the things that 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 you kind of said you need to, to deliver, and, and things that you aspire to you know, to achieve. So, you know, going public for us is like the forcing function, or well, one of the force, one of the reasons, and one of the forcing functions to build like an enduring an enduring company. And you know, neutron investment aside, if you take that out, Rocket Lab is actually a nice little profitable company. It's 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 really good. Um, but, you know, we're making those investments into Neutron, you know, right now because we think, you know, ultimately uh, that's going to set us up for, for being a much larger company in, in the future. So um, it's kind of, I look at it in, in kind of two ways, you know, half of me is kind of happy, to, happy that we're, we're starting to, to actually, you know, weed out the aspirational from, from the executors. And of course, the, the, the downside is, you know, some people are losing a bunch of money. Um, and this been some just amazing engineering feats done, you know, created and achieved and, and teams built. Amazing people have done amazing things. But at the end of the day, it's all for now if, um, you know, if, if you can't be profitable and, and sustainable at, at the end. And I think, um, you know, capital has been flowing into, this, into, the, into the space industry, which is, which is wonderful. But, um, you know, it has to flow in, in, in a way that, that delivers returns ultimately for, you know, for everybody. Excellent. 
Peter, you have, I got to warn you, man, next time you're back on NSF Live, we, we're going to have to ask you some more curly questions, but <laughs> hopefully I, I saved a good one for the last one there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time to, uh, to join us on this episode of NASA Space Flight Live. Um, thank you to all of our members. Thank you so much. We could not do this without the support of the members. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. There's our launch directors and our flight engineers. That's one of the perks you get when you uh, subscribe at those levels. You get to be at the end of NASA Space Flight Live episodes. So thank you so much to all of our members, especially our launch directors and our flight engineers. Uh, Sawyer, thank you for being on with us today. It's my absolute pleasure. I mean, it's what Rocket Lab is doing is really exciting, Peter, and I'm so glad that you're able to share it with us. And we'll definitely bring the harder hitting questions next time, especially once we see Neutron up and running, too. No worries. That wasn't a call for harder questions, just to be fair. Oh, just, no, you it's, it's, oh, we know. The, the, the stake is in the ground, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and of course, thank you to Kevin for being in the background and operating today's stream. I think with that, we will wrap it and let you go about your day, Peter. Once again, thank you so much for joining us on this awesome discussion. And everybody out there watching, next week, NASA Space Flight Live will be back at the usual time with an intrepid museum show. So stay tuned for that, and we will announce the topic for the next week uh, sometime in the next week. But with that, I think we will call it a day. Thank you so much to Peter. Thank you so much to Rocket Lab for being such an awesome company and being so open with us and just everybody. With that, let's all go. Oh, gosh. Do I really have to say this? It's in the document. Let's all go watch Starbase Live. <laughs>